All righty, Dave, great to have you back on the show, especially as Trump heads to court. We have a lot to talk about, so as usual, I'm just going to jump right in. You've written extensively about your cousin, the very famous, or as we like to say, the infamous Roy Cohn. And Cohn is said to have been Donald Trump's greatest teacher. So do me a favor, tell us who was Roy Cohn. Because you said that he was an incredibly spoiled princeling of an only child. Were there signs from the beginning that he would turn out to be a completely immoral man? Yeah, Michael, and good to see you again, by the way. And thank you for speaking up when you're not under gag orders, because we all need to speak up if we love this country. Uh, Michael, as I tell you about Roy Cohn, I want you to keep three words in mind that apply to Roy Cohn, my cousin, as well as the infamous Donald Trump. Den <clears throat> the three words are deny, delay, distract. That is what Roy Cohn taught him. Now, Roy Cohn, for those who don't know, especially your younger um, listeners and viewers, Roy Cohn was an attorney, was a fixer, was a, a, a mob boss, uh, was a, a mob connector. And he and Donald Trump uh, bumped into each other in 1973. And this is where everything started in my view. Donald Trump and his father were in really in trouble with the federal government because they owned these apartments in Brooklyn and they were denying, they were not letting blacks in rent from these, uh, rent these apartments. And Roy Cohn basically told him, and we've seen this again and again and again from Trump, to just go on the offensive about the government. Don't admit guilt. And in fact, Trump settled out of court, but he went on the offensive about the government. And Roy, for the next 13 years, was his mentor. And Donald Trump was, was you know, at his feet, at his knees, learning these lessons um, Roy, we can go into, but Roy had been just a, a heinous person in the, um, it, well, first of all, he put the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg to death for spying. Um, that never should have happened. It never did happen with anybody else. In the, and, that, and then in the McCarthy era, which some people know about, Senator Joe McCarthy, um, Roy went on this fake campaign against so-called communists in the State Department and elsewhere in the government. Uh, he also went after gay people, even though he was, I wouldn't even say closet. He was openly gay. It just in those days it wasn't talked about, and on and on and on. But but Roy taught Trump to not back down. And I said, as I said again, to deny, to delay, and to distract. And it's incredible to me, Michael. You served thirteen and a half months or whatever it was in the slammer. Nothing, nothing, nothing has happened to Trump yet. No, nothing. And you're right. It was it was 13. It was about 13 and a half months um, out of a what was supposed to be a 36 month sentence. And with federal, you know, good time, 15 percent off, it would have been 30 months. But as a result of covid, which interestingly enough, because the first step act was actually put into play under the Trump administration by Bill Barr, you know, and <laughs> I mean, there's there's so much that we can talk about there. I'm pretty sure had he thought for a second that that would have benefited me to come out early, I guarantee you that the First Step Act never or the CARES Act would never have gotten passed by by Donald. That's 100 percent. In my opinion, that is absolutely accurate. Um, but I want to just go back to when I said that you have said that Roy was an incredibly spoiled princeling of an only child. Now, Donald was clearly not an only child. He was one of five. But he set, he certainly was spoiled, and he certainly held himself out to be a princeling. If you would, sort of describe, because there really is very little in terms of similarities between Donald and Roy Cohn, right? Especially, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about in terms of physical size, that's certainly for sure. In terms of intelligence, that's definite. But they both had this sort of narcissistic, sociopathic sort of personality disorder. Do me a favor, because nobody obviously knows Roy like you do. How do you compare the two? Right. And just to refresh for people who are just 
uh, tuning in now. So Roy Marcus Cohn, this infamous and dastardly and evil attorney, was my father's first cousin. And I was a young, I was a college student and then a young journalist. And I went to his parties. I followed him around. I wrote a story about him for Vanity Fair as he was dying of AIDS. Uh, again, he said it was cancer, but it was AIDS. Everything with Roy was a mirage. So let's talk about the differences. First of all, yes, Roy, as despicable as he was, was brilliant. For one example, Michael, Roy was on trial and all kinds of crazy things happened with the juror's father dying and so forth. But ultimately, Roy's lawyer died before there was time to make the final argument. Roy had not testified. So Roy was allowed to get up and act as his own lawyer. Without notes, he spoke over two days for a dozen hours. He did the summation with no preparation. He he was heinous, but he was incredibly smart at his peak. And he basically, he got himself off it, it, acting on his own lawyer. Now, you and I know that Trump with his third grade vocabulary could never do a two day, 12 hour summation to a jury. He just couldn't. He would fulminate, he would anger, he would he would lash out against the judge. So Roy was really small and really smart. And yes, he was a little, little guy and he was all, his nose was scarred and his face was scarred because of some bad botched plastic surgery. Um, Trump was physically different. And then yes, Roy, but it, there's a we some weird things that I think, and some people in my family would agree with, which is that Roy, Roy's dad was a judge and actually a respected judge. And Roy had to prove himself and distinguish himself somehow. Trump, his father was developer and Trump had to live up to his father's reputation. Now his father was also a, a, a horrible person, but in Trump's eye, he was sort of a God. And, and both these these men are still, I think, are still trying to please and, 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 and show off to their parents. Um, Roy had a doting mother, so much so that when he went to summer camp, she rented a cottage just down the road from the summer, so the overnight camp, so she could go check on him every day. That's what it was. Trump's mother, on the other hand, was completely out of it from everything we've heard. Uh, she was just, she had a lot of issues. And, but, but there's a weird kind of sort of almost father-son relationship when they meet in 1973 and Roy is counseling Trump to not give in to the government, to go after the government, to lash out against the government. Trump took to him and Roy took to him. And, and you know, I want to make sure that I'm clear about this. I think Roy loved, you know, fair haired, golden boys and Trump in those days, didn't look like he does now. And he was by some, I saw him at parties. He was a good looking guy. I guess you'd say Roy maybe had a thing about, you know, he liked young Donald Trump. Donald Trump was, I think was 27 when they met. Roy was in his thirties, but Trump is a user, is a, is a transactional person. And he knew that Roy could get him what he needed. Roy paid off people. Roy helped him knock down a historic building and build a hotel. Roy helped him with some unions, basically paying off some unions and mafia bosses so that this, so hotel, so buildings could be built and on and on and on. And so there was a symbiotic relationship with them, but Roy definitely saw him as a mentee and, and Trump looked up to Roy, not physically, but otherwise. And, and scarily, because Trump is not very intelligent, but his reptilian intelligence is he gets things and he knew that what Roy was showing him was you go after people. Look what he said about Judge and Gorin and, and, and the daughter and everybody else. Like this stuff, anybody else in the judicial system, black, white, anything would be in, would be in jail right now for going after a judge's daughter for saying the things he said. And yet it's happened. And I, I, I in a few minutes, I'll tell you. Well, I'll just tell you one example, but later I'll tell you some things. When I look back and read some stories, well, well, about, Dave, let me just let okay. me just correct you on something. It was actually it's Judge Mershon who Donald oh, was Judge going Mershon's after daughter, the yeah. daughter with Judge Ngoron. He went after the law clerk. That's Not what to it mention, was. of course, he goes after witnesses. He goes after anybody who he deems to be a threat to him, to the case, uh, to his future. He goes after them with, as you said appropriately, this reptilian uh, sort of um, behavior. Right. Sorry, I made that, that slip up. But 
But the odd thing is I've been looking back at what Roy did in those days, and he did the same kind of thing. In fact, um, he called Andrew Young was a prominent black leader in the 60s and 70s, and, and Roy called him a racist. Roy said about the future, he said, I'm worried that I'm, I believe there's going to be a communist world someday. The, the same phrases that Roy used in the 60s and 70s and 80s, Trump is still using today. Man, listen, if it works, fuck it, stick with it, right? I mean, that's Donald Trump's theory. In fact, you know, when you start reflecting back in history and you see, for example, like Stalin or Hitler used to have this thing where they would repeat a lie over and over and over again, because ultimately the belief is that the lie becomes the truth. He also learned very well that if you denigrate somebody and you dehumanize them, for example, the way Hitler would portray Jews as a rat, nobody would have a problem with the extermination of a rat. I think if you would have called them humans, there might be some real issues there in terms of asking somebody to exterminate a human being. Right now, of course, there's still always these MAGA sociopaths that are just willing to do whatever it is because they have so much hate in their heart, in their in their head, in their soul. It doesn't matter. They just live to hate. Roy was very similar. And he and from my understanding, he was very similar in terms of the ability to denigrate people on demand. Yeah, he was he was quick with an insult, and he um, he had a, a you know a range of them. I mean, Trump in the last few days has been calling immigrants animals. Like it's just where is our outrage? Why are we not? Why are we not? After this, Trump comes from immigrants, I come from immigrants, you come from immigrants. Like this is a country of immigrants, and the fact that he's saying that, and nobody in his party stood up to him, is reprehensible. And that's the least of what he said sometimes. Yeah. Can we go back to what you were talking about before with Joe McCarthy? Because Roy was the lawyer of choice for rich and let's just say less than respectable people. The, the mob, especially during that period of time. And Trump's amongst them. We also know that Roy was Joe McCarthy's right hand man during what was referred to as the Red Scare trials. But who else did Roy Cohn represent that you're aware of and for what crimes? Okay, it's funny you said that because I, I was just reading a fantastic Esquire story from 1907, from years ago, and they, they list just some of the people he represented. This shows you kind of how Roy operated with, uh, with every sector from real estate to the mob to the Catholic Church. So here's some of his clients um, over the years. The Catholic Archdiocese of New York. The biggest names in New York real estate, including the Lefrak family, the Helms family, of course, the Trump family, also Warren Avis, who was then a, the, of the Rent-A-Car family. And now the mob folks that were not the nicest people. Carmine Lalo Galante, um, who was called the boss of bosses, Fat Tony Salerno, Nicholas Cockeyed Nick uh, Rattanini, uh, Rattani, um the Gambino brothers, Thomas and Joseph Gambinos, who are the son of the sons of Carlo Gambino and George Steinbrenner, who owned the Yankees. It goes on and on. And it's incredible. So Roy ingratiated himself. Let's see if this sounds, sounds familiar. He was too cheap to give money to politicians, but he corralled other people to give money to Democrats and Republicans and conservatives. And would Trump ever really give a lot of his money? No, but he, Pressures money to give to so-called Republicans, which is actually him. So it's a fascinating thing to see the parallels of these two men. And you you mentioned Joe McCarthy. Joseph McCarthy was a senator and a not a very smart one, and a man who, frankly, everyone in Washington said had a little problem with the the booze. And but he needed a pit bull. He needed Roy Cohn, and they realized just about just as you were saying. You could be nice as a politician and you could talk about bringing every, everybody together and kumbaya and all that stuff. And God bless the Democrats. They tried that over the years and it's not working right now. Roy 
instructed McCarthy to go after, to scapegoat people who did nothing, but because they were gay, because there were some who were more to the left, uh, because some of them were Hollywood scriptwriters and, and actors and producers, they realized they could go after these people and galvanize public opinion until, until it went too far, until they took on the U.S. Army and that their whole McCarthy Army hearings went down in flames in the 50s. Yeah. Look, you know, I had told you the first time that I had you on my podcast a while ago that I actually had met Roy when I was like 14, 15 years of age in Brooklyn at a club called the El Carib, which was notorious for having two groups of people. You had Italians and Jews, right? The Italians were all mobbed up and the Jews thought that they were mobbed up because they shared a cabana next to a guy who was mobbed up. And that was the first time uh, that I had ever met, you know, Roy Cohn. And it was funny because the, what I distinctly remember is how people were gravitating to him. And when I say people, I'm talking about some of the toughest guys that you've ever seen uh, and who had reputations that were even tougher than their physical appearances. Uh, I mean, these guys were the real, these were the real deal in you know the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, I mean, that was incredible how people used to flock around him for advice. It, you would think that he was like the Carlo Gambino, right? Where, you know, everybody wanted to have that moment or two of alone time with him as if it was something spectacular. And I suspect that it probably was. You know, everybody also knows that during a time where in the in the 80s, when nobody was able to get concrete, that there was some real issues. And especially it was because Fat Tony Salerno had basically cornered the entire concrete market in Manhattan. And the city of New York needed concrete. And so interestingly enough, the city of New York was using Fat Tony Salerno in order to obtain its concrete. And this is so crazy. So basically the city was all mobbed up, overpaying for concrete somehow or another, while everybody else is eating shit because they can't get their projects moving. There's just no concrete available. Somehow Tom Donald manages to get concrete for the Fifth Avenue building or for the hotel. It was one of the two properties. And he did it simply because Tony Salerno got him the concrete that he needed and a little extra in case they needed it. That's because something. Roy Cohn, because exactly, because Roy Cohn made that connection, and that was it. We don't know who paid what, but when it, Roy was involved, there usually was money changing hands somewhere under the table. Yeah, and look, Donald talked about that all the time. That when nobody else is able to get something, he's able to get it. And so, and you got it. You got it. Like you said, he's reptilian. This guy, in the event of like a nuclear holocaust, like a cockroach. He'd probably be the sole survivor on the planet. And that would be just fine. That'd be just fine for him, right? He wouldn't mind it. As long as he could be by himself, right? He would be with his with his best friend, himself in his own reflection. It's truly, it's, it's an astonishing um, personality or character flaw. But let me then move on because you also turned around and said before that Roy started representing Fred and Donald in the 1970s after the Department of Justice sued them for racist rental practices. And a lot of people then say that it was actually that suit which is the origin of Donald's hatred for the DOJ. Yeah. And that's another thing, too. We're going to talk about that after. But his hatred for the DOJ and law enforcement, I find it so reprehensible that law enforcement or military members are actually supporting a guy who talks about the DOJ, law enforcement as being enemies of the country. He talks about, for example, military folks who either die or were injured as being suckers, right? And yet they're still backing him. He's calling for the execution 
of General Mark Milley simply because Mark Milley exposed him for what he is. So do me a favor. Tell my listeners what what exactly happened during that time. I mean, did the Trumps go to trial? Because I'm not certain they did. No. So, yeah, Michael, thank you, because that sets the stage for so much of what we witnessed through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the aughts, the last decade and this decade. I mean, it's that one thing that did not even go to trial. So what happened was the DOJ had definitive, and I mean definitive proof that Donald and Fred Trump were discriminated against blacks. Why? Because when a black family wanted to rent the, in their apartments, someone would write the word, the letter N on a card. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what N stood for, but your, li- your, re- your listeners are very smart and they can figure out what N stood for. Now the DOJ was closing in. They nailed him. And incredibly Roy told him, not only don't admit guilt, not only don't concede anything, but sue them. And so Trump sued the Department of Justice for a hundred million dollars. Now this is 1973, this is early 1970s when there weren't so many inflated lawsuits, Trump style, which you know about. And they, of course it was a joke, the suit. And in fact, as often happens with Trump University and Trump Airlines and Trump Vodka and Trump uh, tire salesmen and Trump Bible. Trump steak and Trump this and Trump that. They, without admitting conceding guilt, they actually, Trump actually settled and paid a fine quietly. Now the hundred million dollar lawsuit against the Department of Justice went nowhere, but that taught Trump a lesson which, which we've seen in the last few months, which you've seen in the last few months, which is just be a bully, just be a braggart, just go after anybody who's right in going after you. And our justice system, Michael, is not set up for this. Our Democratic Party is not, does not have the backbone to stand up to this. The fact is when someone's a bully, you need to do something about it. You can't negotiate and bring them back. And you dealt with, um, you know, you dealt with, 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 um, uh, William, William Boondoggle Barr. And now, you know, I, I have to tell you, you know, Marshmallow Merrick Garland is, is just, is, is not, he's been so slow to start investigating, investigating Trump, so slow to, invo- to, to appoint Jack Smith. It's Trump knows how to manipulate the system. He knows how to get out of these things. And so what's happening is that that lesson of 1973 was you don't have to play by the rules that other people play by, that other defendants play by. And that's what especially, we're seeing. Especially if you have the money to play that game, which Trump does, even without the stupid support of all of his MAGA supporters, he has enough money to play this game. You may recall, it wasn't that long ago that he sued me. Again, he throws out numbers that are astonishing for two reasons. One, because it's supposed to intimidate you. And two, because it gets media attention, which is what he always wants. Media attention on everything. He sued me in the Southern Uh, District of Miami for $500 million. Yeah, that didn't go anywhere. No, well, well, I'll tell you what it did. It went into my pocket. You know, you have to defend that. And people were really spectacular. And uh, a GoFundMe was set up that, you know, helped to defray some of the costs for that. And now we have other legal matters that, you know, need to end up getting defrayed. It's insane. But I, I bring up that $500 million lawsuit because you can't imagine getting served with a document. And when you look to see what the what the amount of that lawsuit is, and you see $500 million, I don't give a shit who you are. This is now weighing on your head because you never know how a court is going to respond. Now, of course, I knew that this case was horseshit, but you still have to defend it. More important than even the amount and everything, I know how Donald Trump plays the game. I understand it. In fact, I was partially responsible 
for creating his playbook later on, where too many people would start to refer to me as his next Roy Cohn. And I, at first I took it as a compliment. I don't, but at first I took it as a compliment because whatever you want to say about Roy Cohn, he was effective. He was unscrupulous. He was rough, but he was effective for getting what his client needed. All right. And that's, and that's why I turned around and I said, I'm not even going to answer the complaint. We're going to make a motion for discovery in lieu of answering the complaint. And every time that we tried to get that moron at the EBT table, the examination before trial, a deposition, he would jump ship. He would do it. So then we get yeah. it court ordered. He then, his lawyer got COVID, right? And so we needed to adjourn it for 30 days. And another, as you said, delay, distract, right? Delay, distract. That's exactly what was until ultimately the court had had enough. And they said, you have no choice. You have to sit for this deposition. And then he withdraws the complaint several days before that deposition date is due. I do have to say, on Donald's behalf, well played. Well, well played by him. He ended up financially costing me money. Yep. He ended up getting or making a lot of money by going to his supporters for their assistance, right? Playing off of that. And then he ultimately never had to sit for the deposition because he drops the case. You know, another one that he did the same thing when he bought Seven Springs. His intention was to turn Seven Springs into a golf course, into a club, using that main house, which is magnificent, as, mm -hmm. the, as, the, as the clubhouse, and then just redesigning the interior. But there's like, you know, 400 plus acres, it'd be a beautiful golf course. The problem, yeah. it's right in the middle of a insanely expensive neighborhood, right? I mean, directly living beneath him on that mountain in Katona, Bedford, is Nelson Peltz. So when he couldn't get the zoning, because it's not zoned commercial, it's zoned residential, he sued. He sued the incorporated town of Bedford, Katona. And years later, when they needed to up their bond for the village, they needed to come to him because he had like a $500 million lawsuit against yeah. them, and they could not get a bond that would not affect every single person in that zip code. It would have increased everybody's real estate tax just in a bond. And so Roy taught him well. Yeah, as and actually- as, could, as long as you could hold out and you could keep fucking with the system. If this was England and you went by that system, where loser pays, yeah. Donald, Donald would be out of business many years ago. Well, it should be that. And so it's funny you said that. So I'm looking at this Esquire story from years ago and when Roy was still alive. Uh, Roy died in 1986 um, of complications of AIDS, by the way. As I said, we'll get into that in a minute. But um, this is what, uh, the, the, what Esquire magazine wrote. Roy was indicted four times and always acquitted. He has suffered several judicial reprimands for unethical conduct. He's had his wrists slapped in civil cases. He's been ordered to make restitution. He was indicted for violating Illinois banking laws. The, inter the IRS has audited his income tax returns for 19 years and seized some of his assets. He's been the target of criticism and innuendo about his ethics, his finances, his personal life. He's even been accused of conspiring to murder a young man. Now, that has parallels. Look, I mean, Trump indicted in four criminal cases, 91 felony counts. And, and you know, if you you want to back the blue, great. Let's talk about Brian Citrick. Let's sick, sick, let's talk about the, the, the Capitol Hill and my and the, and the DC Metro police officers who've died by suicide. The families, some of some of those families are saying, what about Trump? What's Trump's responsibility for the for the insurrection uh, in, in, on January 6th? We need to talk about these things. You're talking about them. But where is everybody else? And and I will agree. I think it was Joe Walsh, the former congressman who was on with you the other day. Mm -hmm. And 
Yeah, I will agree with him against you on one thing, which is I think these MAGA supporters are, they just, they're just confused. I'm not going to blame them for everything in that. I think they, they want to be good people and good family people, some of them, many of them, but there's, the world is changing. They don't know. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about the things. And if you have Fox News on at your house 24 hours a day or OAN or these or certain tweets or, you know, the eight people who are actually on Trump social, uh, Trump truth, uh, the Trump truth, whatever it's called. Um, yes, you're going to be in it. You're going to be inculcated. You're going to be brainwashed. But I, I think what we all should be doing, especially people like you who know Trump is constantly doing what you're doing, telling people the truth, telling people the guy doesn't pay carpenters. He doesn't pay anybody. He cheats on his wives. You know, I mean, he's selling a Bible for God's sake. What is it? Is it, does he have like a, you know, the, the Psalms about, about how adultery is good. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this then, because you once said that Roy Cohn didn't just educate Trump, but that he put Trump in with people who would make Trump like that Tony Salerno. Who were those people or who was the top dog that you think that Roy had made or put into, into touch with Donald that made him? And obviously how Trump then would benefit from knowing those people. Okay, well, this won't surprise you, Roger Stone. So for those people who don't know, I was in Roy's office in the 1980s. I was at that time, I might have been writing a paper for college. No, actually, I was doing the Vanity Fair magazine story. And Roger Stone was not well known, but Roger Stone was there. He was a bag man. He was raising money for Ronald Reagan on the East Coast. And and Roy had decided that he liked Ronald Reagan when Reagan really had no support in New York and around there. There was a lot of money. And I was with him when Roger Stone was talking to him about Roy Cohen and fundraising and so forth. Um, Roy connected him with Rupert Murdoch, who was then an emerging publisher and about to own a lot of TV stations and Fox Network. And Roger Stone became a, was, was, you know, had started, had started with, with Richard Nixon, but then worked for Reagan, then worked for, then became increasingly kind of paranoid and crazy and whatever you want to call him. And Roger Stone was the kind of person who taught Trump the art of fundraising, the art of dark politics. And he begat Steve Bannon and people like that. All that emerged from the, from Roy's context. And Roy was the one who connected Rupert Murdoch and Donald Trump. Now you can, I, I could tell you, and you could probably confirm Roger Ailes, who basically ran Fox mm -hmm. for years, invented Trump the politician, along with, of course, you know, people like Roger Stone. But this all came from Roy's contacts, Roy's connections in the 70s and 80s, and we're still paying for it. Yeah. You know, what's funny is Trump never particularly cared for Roger Stone. He found him weird uh, from his looks to his behavior when he found out, because you know, Trump sort of, I shouldn't say sort of, Trump dumped Roy Cohn when he found out that he had AIDS. It freaked him the fuck out and so on. When similarly, when Roger Stone was with his wife and there was articles about him being swingers and um, walking in the gay pride parade in assless chaps and you can go online and you can see the, the photos. It freaked Trump out to the point that he wanted nothing to do with Roger either. It was only until going back to 2011 when he was contemplating on the run against Barack Obama did Roger Stone reemerge uh, into the picture. But he always called him, you know, things like the dirty trickster, right? Or he always used to say that Roger's full of shit, you know, when Roger... Uh, claim that he was speaking with Julian Assange and and so on, you know, but he never stopped permitting the phone calls. It's it is a real talent to be able to fuck somebody over, to be actually nasty to them to their face, and 
look, behind the back, they they wouldn't know. But he was even nasty to Roger to his face. And then have that person still come back into your life and do your bidding. It is a talent. Well, he look, you know, he used really Giuliani until he didn't. Like when Rudy Giuliani had you know, oil leaking out of his head or something, you know, Trump got disgusted. Trump, the ultimate germaphobe, the ultimate sort of person who, who worries about about other people's looks. What you said about Roy is actually a really poignant story and a really important story about Trump, transactional Trump. So in 1986, Roy was really declining. His memory, which had been incredibly sharp, was fading. He was not useful as a lawyer. And of course, he was about to get disbarred and he was disbarred in June of 1986. But Trump realized that Roy was no longer of use to him, even though Roy had faithlessly served Trump for 13 years and rarely, by the way, apparently even charged him for his services because Roy was so disorganized, he never billed people. He basically just, as Trump would do, he just took money from the law firm and spent it on his own stuff and 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 didn't declare it and didn't, you know, it didn't bother the IRS with it and, and let the, the rest of us pay taxes. Um, sound familiar? Do you know that? You know that what Trump does, you are, you're very aware of what Trump does for payments to Stormy Daniel, Daniels or anything. Anything Roy spent, he just declared a business expense. So basically he was falling apart, Roy, in 1986 and Trump stopped returning his calls. And I know because I was observing Roy's final months and Roy was really hurt by that. Now I'm not telling you a sob story. I'm not defending Roy. I'm just telling you what I observed. Um, other friends like Barbara Walters stood by Roy in those days, but Trump did not. He got very, he got scarce. He invited him to a dinner at some point, but a lot of times Roy couldn't travel and so forth. And he basically stiffed him. And then Roy was disbarred as everybody expect, expected in June of that year, 86. And he died a month later. Trump was scarce during those tough times. That's when you would think a true friend, someone who had made millions of dollars off your counsel and your advice and your illegal connections and your mob connections and your city government connections would at least, you know, come visit you, but not Trump. A, so because it sounds, was, David, does it sound very similar, right, to what, what he did, for example, to me? He will throw anyone under the bus, right? It's about time that Rudy Colludi, drunken Giuliani, w- wakes up as well and realizes, you know, in Rudy's bankruptcy, which he just filed as a result of, you know, his work for Donald uh, regarding, you know, the... Fulton County, Georgia scenario, the trying attempt to overturn the free and fair election. He now owes, for example, like Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, a ton of money that he does not have. You know, on his bankruptcy filing, the single greatest asset that Giuliani has is his outstanding legal bill from Donald Trump. And see, I was talking to a buddy of mine and I turned around and said, good fucking luck to anybody thinking that they're going to get that because chances are Rudy never got an engagement letter or anything to that extent. He will ultimately get nothing on that either. So let me, let me ask you on on that note, because we see Trump weaseling out somehow of every single legal situation that he's embroiled in. And then somehow, somehow at the very last minute on like the 11th hour, 59th minute, and maybe 32nd. It seems like something always saves him from saving him from facing the consequences. My question to you, Dave, you think it's luck or is it cunning? Well, that's a that's something I've really wrestled with because Roy Cohn was similar. And in some cases, for Roy, as I said, like a juror's father died and it stalled the whole trial. That was luck, right? I mean, I, I don't want to say it was, it was terrible luck for the juror, but it was good luck for Roy. I think he, 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 cunning is cunning is a probably good word for it. He's just a manipulator and he knows that he can push a system like nobody else. You said rich people take advantage of systems. Of course they do. But there are consequences for other 
people often. And yet with Fannie Willis, with everything that's happened in, in, in all these trials, I mean, also not for nothing, but there was some luck. He appointed, he appointed, um, in, in Florida, you know, he appointed the, um, the, uh, uh, judge Eileen Luce Cannon, right? So she's totally destroyed that amazing. This is a case about basically taking documents and giving them to who? To Russia? To Saudi Arabia? We don't know who we they don't went know. To. That's the problem. Well, I think I think there are some people in the Justice Department, some people in the FBI, and some people in his own employ who do know. But we're never going to find that. We're never going to find that out because Luce Cannon has. Just she's dismantled this whole case, and it's there's incredible luck in that way. But also, he's he's just his being immortal. Immoral has worked in his favor. He has no sense of right and wrong, and nothing applies to him. He's never responsible for anything. And if you're that brazen, once and wealthy, once in a while you get away with it, and it's incredible. And that is a lesson of Roy's. Roy was indicted four times. I said. The cases against him should have been open and shut cases um, for stealing, for um, for um, for manipulating a, a man, a dying man uh, on his deathbed to totally change the will so that Roy was an executor for a 70 plus million dollar will. All those things did not come back to haunt Roy, except, and this is my point to you, Michael, this is why it's interesting. You and I talked a year ago, and I'm going to tell you, I still think that this that karma is going to get Roy that that Donald Trump that that the karma that got Roy um the IRS got him he was disbarred he was uh, he was ill and he died you can't escape this forever he certainly has for now and if we can just get this if something can happen before November, November 5th we can save this country well you know we do have of course the April 15th the uh business record fraud case. You know, the one question I would ask you, because you did bring up that Roy also was indicted four times, just like Donald. Uh, I think um, Roy had 88 counts against him. Donald beat, you know, beat him, you know, winning uh, 91. How do you think that Roy and Donald behave similarly towards judges and prosecutors and witnesses, if you could sort of parallel the two of them? Well, it's so interesting because I was, again, I was reading history. So um, when Roy was tried by Robert Morgenthau, the U.S. attorney, um, by the way, backed by, by U.S. attorney Robert Kennedy, um, the, um, the, there was a grand jury that said that Roy tried to obstruct justice. Um, and there was a stock swindling scheme. And of course he was obstructing Gusson, justice. This was another really good case against Roy. And what did Roy say? He said that Robert Kennedy and, and Robert Morgenthau were engaged in a vendetta, quote unquote vendetta. He lashed out at the people who were after him. Normal people, normal defendants don't do that. They just don't go after the people who are going after them. But what are the, what is the justice system done? What real penalties have there been for going after a law clerk, for going after a judge's daughter, for nothing, nothing, nothing. So far, but, so far, zilch. So far, I zilch. It, I mean, you know, right. it, it infuriates me because he goes after me as well. And by by doing that, by blowing this dog whistle, despite the fact that there's a gag order, his MAGA supporters start attacking. Like, I'm regularly attacked by this by you know by this uh i don't even know what she is this La uh, laura loomer right every day there's something nasty and despite the fact that she was wrong of course maga donald roy Cohn would never admit that they're wrong right the the wrong thing she put started you know running around out there that the affair was not really Donald and Stormy, but rather me and Stormy. Even Michael Avenatti, a day or so afterwards, and he, believe me, we are not friends. We don't like each other at all. He even put out a statement where he turned around and he said that the recent claims by Tony Saruga, who was some either business partner, they shared 
an office or what have you, are fabricated, bogus, and bullshit, and complete bullshit. He's making up stories in a desperate attempt to try and escape being a nobody. But Laura Luma can't go ahead and acknowledge, hey, I fucked up, I made a mistake. OAN went out, put out statements, so did some local Gazette newspaper, all all defamation claim, you know, all defamation claim, you know, possibilities, but not her. She's, of course, incapable, just like Donald, of error. Wasn't me who turned around and said, I've never apologized to God because I've never made a mistake. They don't believe that they're capable of making mistakes. And they're certainly incapable of owning them. But Michael, you've said something very important. I'm not going to ask you to repeat a certain phrase you use, but it rhymes with sits in pants. I noticed, people noticed, when Roy Cohn, when everything was closing in on him, nothing had really happened, but his health was ill. He was about to get disbarred. The IRS was coming after him. The, the defendants, the, the plaintiffs in cases were coming after him. He got very scared. This is a guy who was ruthless, was manipulative, was untouchable for decades in DC and New York. But finally, he was an emotional mess. He was crying to his secretary. He was frail. He didn't know what to do. I think you know better than I do. I, I certainly don't hang out with Trump, but I did see him in those days. He seemed like he was just a braggart. Um, and I knew we knew even then he wasn't paying his bills. This stuff, you can screw over small little people, as he would call them, all the time. You can lie and manip manipulate. But when it really comes to your reputation or your money at your Roy Cohn or your Donald Trump, that's all you have. You don't. Roy, Roy, Donald Trump does not have real friends. I don't. I have a feeling he doesn't confide in Melania every night when they're in bed together since they have separate bedrooms, apparently. Um, I think that finally he is looking around and yes, he's, you know, incredibly, amazingly, he's a Republican nominee, but I think he's got to be scared about the things that are going to happen to him and the things that could come out about him. And the fact is that Alina Haba Haba, all these people who are defending him, you, you're right, he'll throw them under the bus. And eventually we would assume you're going to have generals speaking out again, again, uh, about him and the Cheney field is family speaking out against him vociferously in the next few months. Something could happen, maybe. Yeah, well, look, speaking about, you know, Haba and others, I mean, look, Donald surrounds himself with a coterie of unscrupulous lawyers that are working for him right now, like Haba, like this guy Brito, like Kai's, you know, like um, Roberts, you know, I mean, there's a whole slew of them. But even good lawyers think to all time lows working for him. Can you think of some instances where Trump's lawyers are behaving like Cohn? And of course, the easiest response for that is, well, I don't know, you tell me. You were the one that acted probably most similar. I don't think so. I think that the group that's there right now are acting very similar. Well, What's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think you're, listen, I'm not going to pass judgment on you. And I, and frankly, you know, I've said this to you before. I'll say it again to everybody here. I think the Department of Justice, Merrick Garland, starting with him, they owe you an apology. They owe you restitution. You paid, you weren't involved with Stormy Daniels. You paid for his crimes. He's paid nothing for it. And I, and I think there should be a campaign to restore your name and to expunge you and to pay you restitution. That's just the way we work in this country. We're fair. And if we made a mistake, well, we do by it. the way, we're, by the way, we're not fair. And you know that I brought a lawsuit against the United States government, against Trump, Bill Barr, the DOJ, the Bureau of Prisons for the unconstitutional remand of me. You know, I, know. I, I talk about it quite often, and I think it's extremely important for people to understand. I was given a two page counterfeit document by Adam Pakula and Enid Phoebus over at the Department of Probation, where I was supposed to go to sign a document for a federal location monitoring agreement, right after I had gotten out as a result of COVID. That document does not exist. 
It does not exist in the in the federal um, you know document system. They made it up. There's spelling mistakes. There's grammatical mistakes. And because I refused to sign it, because it way it it literally impinged upon my First Amendment constitutional right. They have a guy named Patrick McFarland, a residential reentry manager from Manhattan Detention Center, signed this remand order, and they sent me back to solitary confinement for another. 15 days. And because of the Dobbs decision, the Dobbs decision didn't just affect Roe versus Wade. It affects a case called Bivens, which would have given me the ability to bring the lawsuit so that we can find out the truth, who was involved. And I know who was involved. It was straight up the top to Barr and Barr did nothing except what Donald told him to do. Because I think the answer, not to answer the question myself, but the lawyer who I think behaved most like Roy Cohn, was Bill fucking Barr. Okay, so that that leads you back to the question you asked me. So Bill Barr, now Bill Barr, belatedly has spoken out against Trump. You notice that the people who were advising Trump, who were his, who were doing the, the legal work for Trump, they're being tainted by all this stuff. Not enough, Not they're not suffering... A lot of consequence, some of them, but some of them are being disbarred. Some of them are getting in big trouble. And you asked about Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn, for years and years, it was great to be in his orbit, to be one of his associates, to be one of his best friends. To be, But what happened? He was nominally or he was basically in charge of a law firm and had a townhouse, gorgeous townhouse on Park Avenue in Manhattan, right off right off Park Avenue on 68th Street. Now, of course, it was Roy's thing. Nobody kept track. The plaster was falling and so forth, but it was worth millions and millions of dollars. Would have been worth more if they'd actually kept it up. But when he was disbarred, when everything happened with him, his partners suffered the consequences after he died. Stanley Friedman, who was a big act, he was a politician in New York who became a partner in that firm or was associated with that firm, his reputation was ruined, I would say. Thomas Boland, who was the the other big partner in that, another big partner in that firm, he was, he was, we don't know what he knew about what Roy did, but he was certainly benefiting from it. His reputation was ruined, I would say. I've tried to find some papers in that firm, what happened to everything, but I, I don't know where everything went, but I can tell you the Rolls Royce with the RMC, Roy Marcus Cohen, plates that sat outside, outside the Bentley, gone, but taken by the IRS the townhouse taken by the IRS. So even after his death, Roy's clique, Roy's posse, Roy's associates suffered. Their reputations were ruined. Their their office was seized. Their business essentially was closed. Now, has that happened enough with the people around Donald? No, but you know better than I do, to be an attorney for Donald Trump means likely you're going to be in trouble at some point. If he doesn't stiff you and dump you, then the government's going to go after you for 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 all the illegal things that and improper things that have happened. So, and the bar associations are belatedly. Now, should this happen sooner? Should there be more consequences? Of course. Yeah. So let me ask you this then. For, for criminal trials pending against Trump right now, you think that Trump will evade the law again, right? You think that he's going to get away with all of it or some part of it or none of it? What's your thoughts on that? You know, I I guess because, unfortunately, I'm related to Roy Cohen. Unfortunately, and because I watched him, I am concerned as an American who wants justice for everybody. I am concerned that Trump learned so much from him that he has masterfully, not really masterfully, because it's been haphazard and not well done, but somehow he's gotten delay after delay after delay. If these trials go too close to election day in November, there's going to be all kinds of ways to go to the Supreme Court or hold off on them. And after November 5th, if he's president, you know, after next January, if he's president, God save us all. And there's going to be no trials. I still think that you know better than I do, but the trial that you've been involved in in New York, 
th which to me is not the most important trial for the security of the country, but is important that that's going to go through. But but the documents in case with with Luce Cannon, Judge Luce Cannon in Florida, no way with thousands of pages and hundreds of witnesses, no way are we going to see that go to trial, which is too bad because Jack Smith did a masterful job. You go back to Robert Mueller, you go back to Mueller report, nothing happens to this guy, but I still think there's a chance he's going to slip up. He really is off his rocker. And you know, when I saw him in those early days, for whatever you can say about him being a manipulator, being a liar, being... He was in his own weird way, charming, and he was, he was articulate. He would give a toast to Roy Cohn at Roy's birthday party in that townhouse every year. And it was short. It wasn't exactly, you know, he's not quoting Shakespeare. Okay. But it was cogent. It was, it was, it was appropriate. The guy, there's something wrong with him. And you can say, everybody's going to say, you know, I, I hear this all the time from my friends. You know, I say, Donald Trump essentially was convicted of rape in New York. I mean, E. Jean Carroll case is clear. And you may, the New York doesn't And use you the have word people rape. that turn around right now and they say, well, it's not, it's not rape. It was sexual assault. And then they attack E. Jean Carroll. Yeah. She's for a being hero. By successful that. and for winning. And for winning the case, oh, well, you know, nobody could have won that case. Uh, it was already preset, you know, because that's what Trump does. He talks about the system is rigged. The system is rigged. He's already out there, not just him, but his acolytes. They're out there making these statements that the cases are rigged. The judges are are rigged, that the entire case against him is already predetermined. And that, you know, any witness that's there that's testifying, despite the fact that there's documentary evidence, be it, you know, emails, texts, whatever it might be, checks, who knows, right? Whatever it is, they're willing to look past the documentary evidence in order to save Donald Trump's reputation. A man who now not once, but twice was hit for defamation after being convicted of sexual assault. That under the statute is considered rape. But where's, you know, Lauren Boebert that, you know, and Ivanka Trump, the champions of women, where are they in this? And also I'm a, you know, I spent years as a journalist. Uh, you know this, I lived in Latin America. I lived in Texas. I lived in Florida. I love journalists, but the media, this whole both sides silliness is ridiculous. So basically someone says Donald Trump raped and someone says, oh, but Joe Biden tripped. Like, Joe Biden is a decent human being who suffered the worst you can imagine losing his wife, losing his kid in, in an auto accident. And, and, and he means well. Now, should he keep running? I wish he would just get up and say, hey, Gavin Newsom or whoever, um, you know, let's have, let's have somebody else take my place. But this whole both sidesism is ridiculous. Okay. The, the, you know, what Trump has done, no other prominent politician in this country has ever done. Um, and so I also, you asked me about the future. Well, I think if the media had more, the old standards, just tell the truth. Don't try to equivocate or, 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 or you know, say, well, on the other hand, Biden's old and Biden tripped. We would have a more informed population. Now, the problem is, of course, people aren't looking at the mainstream media they're looking at their own things and that's really a problem and i and i worry about that michael but i still think that something could catch up with trump in these days that the stuff he's saying is crazy he's alienating people around him he could alienate some in his base at some point just because he's so he's so un untethered yeah so look dave the hour goes by quick here on maya culpa i have one final question for you because it's been said that roy hated himself in the end. Do you think that Donald's capable of enough self-reflection to hate himself or even question his own motives and behavior? Yeah, so Michael, I wish I could say that, but to the contrary, you and I started by talking about the differences between Roy Cohn, Roy Marcus Cohn, and Donald J. Trump. And this is a crucial difference. Roy Cohn was 
occasionally capable of self-reflection, especially as he neared the end. He worried about his reputation. He worried about his legacy. He didn't have any descendants. He didn't have any kids. He didn't have a spouse, male or female. Trump, I, I have to tell you, maybe this is a definition of sociopath. I've been reading psychology. I'm fascinated by this. Trump is in capable. It's not just an act. It's not just like he's pretending to be to, to be uncaring. He doesn't care about Melania. He doesn't care about his kids. He doesn't care about his grandkids. He doesn't care about his friends. He cares about Donald J. Trump, about his image, about his reputation, about his money, about his privacy, about his secrets. And this is the scariest thing to me is that Roy Cohn in the end faced his demons. He didn't do anything. If he was a good Menchie person, as we said, he would have come out and said to his buddy, Ronald Reagan, there are people dying of AIDS. We have to do something. We have to acknowledge it. We cannot stigmatize these people. We cannot vilify these people. He didn't do it. But Trump wouldn't even think about anything like that. He, he, I've never seen anything. I've rarely seen anything like it. He does not have the capacity or the will or the interest or the ability to look inside himself to say he could have he he's a TV. He's, you know, he's Mr. Apprentice. He could have come to government and said, all right, I know I had a divisive campaign. I came down the escalator. I insulted Mexicans, but we're the greatest country in the world. We're going to bring people together. We're going to make things better. We're going to give it health care that's affordable and decent and better than what we have but he doesn't care about other people. And I know because in those years I was writing about Roy Cohn, people would always tell me, Donald Trump stiffed contractors. He didn't pay so-and-so, he didn't pay. So. And Roy was the exact same. Roy left a trail of unpaid people behind. But occasionally at the end, he had some remorse about some of that. Trump has none of that. Yeah, because as I say all the time, he doesn't give a shit about anyone or anything other than himself. Dave, thank you so much for joining me again on Maya Culpa. You stay safe, my friend. And I have I have my fingers crossed, too, that the American people wake the fuck up when they get into the voting booth and they realize, as Joe Biden says, and I think it's the greatest line so far, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And hopefully with that, this will be a massive blue wave and we can rid this country of Trumpism and MAGA once and for all. So thanks for joining me again. Thank you, Michael. Good luck.